let's say you understand what the middle way is and you have clear reasoning mm -hmm. that uh, the only reason you suffer is because of your attitude mm. in regard to feelings mm. it's, you know in a sure. nutshell yep. so that's clear to you and you've reasoned it in all ways and then you think but is it mm. is it the case that my attitude is the cause of myself is it really is that really true mm. Mm -hmm. is the middle way the way to free myself from that suffering mm. to end craving is it really the way mm. so you have a doubt mm -hmm. now what do you do because you, you don't you, you, you don't there's no confirmation that yeah that is the middle this is the middle way this well does that's that's what you do yeah. uh, if you're still doubting it means you don't have the middle way you might have as the suttas would say you might have had like um intellectual grasp of it correct grasp uh, upon reasoning correct reasoning but yeah if the doubt still um, perverts the picture around so to speak so if, if if in face of doubt you know that is the truth means you're beyond doubt like you, you might try to doubt it it's not that um, that you're beyond doubt because you refuse to allow doubt to arise no the doubt the question came up is it and you look at it and it's like yes it is and each time doubt is it yes it is because you've seen it for yourself but if you have a doubt arising it says is it and it's like well i don't know well that's the word so you you don't stop doing it because you doubt it you do it more because you doubt it and uh, and yes that intellectual reasoning that that intellectual grasp of it makes sense that the suffering is rooted in my attitude not in the feelings or in the world yeah, that is a, a kind of a necessary prerequisite. Mm -hmm. Having that intellectual grasp of what the right view is gives you the direction to develop the right view and hence go beyond doubt. So how to go to beyond doubt? Then? So What's how to go beyond doubt is to get the, the, that uh, intellectual correct reasoning first and then uh, when you doubt it, you allow that doubt to arise. And then why, why do you want to go beyond doubt? Because mm. it's unpleasant. Oh. So the pain of the doubt is not rooted in doubt. It's rooted in your craving against it, which aligns itself with your intellectual understanding of what the right view is. Craving is the root of suffering. Not phenomena are the root of suffering. Whether it's doubt or something more physical, doesn't matter. That's not the root of suffering. So through the pain of doubt, you get to see the Four Noble Truths, for example. Or through any pain, for that matter. Through any discomfort. Discomfort of sense restraint. Anxiety that arises on a kind of not using pleasures as the only means of escape from the unpleasant theories and feelings, and so on. Mm -hmm. So any form of displeasure, if you suffer on account of it, you use that to see that the suffering is actually in the attitude. You use basically that to keep applying your correctly reasoned intellectual understanding of what the right view is. And that's like in the suttas, it's found a difference between like a Dhammanusari, they're not Sotapanas yet. But they have understood the right view. But now they need to practice that. Either arrive at that right view through Dhammanusari, like uh, through that intellectual reasoning of the correct kind, or through faith, like, oh, they're just absolutely certain that what the Buddha said must be true. And now they're applying it. So they still both still have to do the work. Mm -hmm. And that work is what takes you beyond doubt. Not takes you beyond ability to ask self-questions or to put your own self into a question, but it takes you beyond ability um, to doubt the right answer. So when you see the right answer, you know it's the right answer. And you can doubt it, and you happily doubt it, and the doubt can never pervert that order and put itself first, because the right answer now is established and seen through and through. So how you go beyond doubt through like repetition of understanding, sufficient repetition of understanding. So that's the thing, uh, the Dhamma Nusari, Sada Nusari, so intellectually you have the idea yeah. correct yeah. but now you also need to apply that you have to do it with no as you said, no result well no exactly exactly no with with uh, the results will come in so yeah. that's always that element of faith in the same sense we said that before you come and see the doctor and based on your own reasoning and knowledge that you acquired about the, you know your condition 
you have a pretty safe bet that out of all the doctors, this will probably be the right one. Makes most sense, not just by reputation, mm -hmm. but even by what you can understand that his medicine is. You see, well, this is based on everything that I know so far, this is most likely going to work, or at least least likely to be wrong out of everything. But you still need to apply the medicine. Because if you say, yes, he's right, but you're not applying medicine, it makes no difference to your condition. Because fundamentally, the whole reason you went to the doctor is to cure yourself from your condition of, of dukkha. So either way, you have to apply it. So you tell, oh, this doctor is the greatest. Why do you think so? I have no clue. Okay, well, did you apply his teaching and confirm that he's great? No, I haven't. Well, then your faith is useless and meaningless. Mm -hmm. But if your faith is like, oh, I have faith that this is least likely to be wrong, and I know that based on, based on the basis of my experience of other doctors and other applications and other medicines, okay, so let me apply this. And then I'll verify if it's right or if it's wrong, if I'm cured of dukkha or I'm not cured but of dukkha. You apply it once and... Well, well, exactly. The whole medicine tells you, you need to apply this for a sufficient amount of time. So, okay, you don't apply it indefinitely for the rest of my life without any confirmation. Because the Buddha himself said, if you do it rightly, the results will have to come. So that's also a good criteria that you can use. Uh, like, for example, if you are convinced that this is the right doctor, yet here you are, 20 years later, you are still subject to dukkha. So is it the right doctor, though? Mm. Have I been doing everything rightly? If so, well, then the instruction was not right, maybe, because I'm not free from this condition. But sometimes people refuse to look that, and admire the doctor for the rest of their life, and they're still not cured. There are only two reasons you won't be cured. Either you're doing it wrongly, the right instruction, or the instruction is not right. And you must basically investigate both if there are no results. Sure, don't expect the results within one day or five days or something. Don't even expect it within a year. Because most people's minds today are lazy and, and driven to centrality. So it's going to take you a bit longer than that. But you know, five years of doing something it's like well am i am i like you know free from doubt free from suffering or not how long will i keep this faith without any verification going maybe i need to reevaluate certain things including the doctor <laughs> but see the, the problem with that is it gets it gets harder to reevaluate the doctor if you spend more time invested in his instruction because it feels like the conclusion of my reevaluation might be i have to start again Oh, I don't want to start again. Well, there you go. You just shot yourself in the foot. No, you always have to be willing to start again 30 years later. If, if you are not free from suffering. If you're free from suffering, you know there is no starting again. This is it. This is the direction that just needs to develop further. But if you still doubt that you're free from suffering and are afraid to start again, practically what you are afraid of is to practice. Because starting again is part of the practice. Part of the finding the right doctor. And then, yes, if you find the right doctor, free yourself from suffering, then you might see in hindsight that all these previous doctors, they were not so right, actually did contribute towards your right search. So it was part of the same progress, but not if you decide you're not going to start again. That's it. You remain stuck with the wrong doctor out of fear to do the work again. You do want to get somewhere. You want to be cured of the condition that's liable to sickness, aging, and death. I mean, the suttas cannot be more clear on that. So here we are practicing the Buddhist teaching seemingly without, you know, don't want, you know, all this is just just um, another becoming, becoming a sort of, yes, it's the right becoming. You use the right becoming to overcome the wrong becoming. And then Arahant goes beyond becoming. But if you start dismissing becoming anything, because you didn't, you couldn't do it, well, basically you're now dismissing the possibility of freedom, freedom from suffering. Because why wouldn't you want to become free from suffering? Well, becoming is bad. Sure, relatively speaking. Mm -hmm. But you can't just dismiss becoming of any kind while you're still subjected to these unwholesome things and you don't know the way out of suffering. That yeah, sounds like that's... The it's an excuse. It yeah. just basically becomes like... That's what I mean. Like you, you got stuck with your doctor. Now you feel too old or too much invested time in this direction to reevaluate, to start again. It's just there's no way. That's why the longer you wait... Mm -hmm. To start questioning yourself rightly, the harder it will be, because as the suttas say, you are accumulating burden, you know, papancha, proliferation, it's an accumulation, it's not a static thing. At any given time, you just give it all up. No, the more you've been engaging with the attitude of not giving it up, the harder it will be to give it up later on. 
So don't wait until that burden becomes too much to give it up. And if you're doing things rightly, there has to be a result. Yeah. Again, there's the, the simile in the suttas we refer to often, you know, the, the, the hand sitting on her, on her eggs. Even if she doesn't think, may these, egg, may these chicks pierce out safely through this shell, they will, because mm -hmm. she's doing the work. So, if you are doing the work, hmm. you, 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 you're kind of confident about the middle way. Hmm. You're beyond doubt. But doubt is still arising. Right. Fear is still arising. Lust, right. anger is still arising. Sure. And then you think, well, that shouldn't be the case. I should have, I should know the truth. Well, then you're not confident then, in the middle way. <laughs> yeah. You, you, you start by saying you're confident in the middle way, but then these things arise and you doubt and you think you shouldn't, means you're not confident in the middle way. If you're confident in the middle way, you would know that these things would still arise, but you know the escape from them. You know what to do. Mm -hmm. You know where the problem is. Well, exactly, exactly. The problem with all of those things you listed is that it makes you feel uncomfortable. It makes you suffer. It may it, it causes a uh, painful feeling, and you know the escape in regard to painful feeling other than sensuality, other than giving in. Now, somebody who is confident in the middle way might become careless, um, lose the sense of urgency, <coughs> content with knowing the escape. Oh, now I have confirmed that this is the right doctor. I already felt the improvement. But then I get careless. I go out, expose the wound to the sun or the, the dirt, as the Buddha would say. And you're not cured. Although you know the way out, you still keep yourself sick through negligence. But sooner or later, you have to address it. If, you, if, you, if, if a person truly has the right view, they cannot pretend and ignore the problem for, for well, not more than seven lifetimes, as the would say. <laughs> so that's the thing. Like, uh, you would, like, for, for Sotapanna, for example, who is obviously not free from sensuality, he can still have pressing desires. He might even give in to them out of carelessness, but fundamentally the pain of it is understood. He, uh, well, the root of the pain is understood, which is your own craving. Not, not the sensuality, not the beautiful objects, not the ugly objects, not the desire, not the lack of desire. The pain is understood, the escape from the pain is understood, the origin and the way leading out of it and so on, that's all understood. In other words, you know exactly where the problem is, mm -hmm. and by knowing where the problem is, you know how to solve the problem, but you do also know that it will take time and the application and not becoming negligent. Yeah, because if, if you've been spending your whole life cultivating lust you know, or anger, mm -hmm. and then you you know the middle way, mm -hmm. and okay, you've confirmed it, mm -hmm. it's not like the lust or the anger that you've been... Of course, of course. Just knowing this, yeah, it, it will not be. It's already significantly diminished. Right. So yes, a, a noble disciple who is not fully enlightened yet can certainly still experience sensual desire and, and anger, but to a degree. It's not like Putujana's anger right. and Putujana's sensuality and Putujana's negligence, because it's it's like he doesn't know the way out. Putujana doesn't know the way out, so it's it's, it's far worse. It can only go so far. Exactly. Yeah. So, so knowing far. the way out, it's it's already like a, a, a massive step towards the escape and the Buddha himself said that he said if, like gaining the right view the amount of suffering that's left for somebody with the right view it's like seven grains of sand and the one without the right view it's like the Mount Sumeru mm -hmm. and the Suttas so, so that's like a gigantic Himala Himalaya mm -hmm. amount of suffering if you don't have the right view mm -hmm. just getting the right view diminishes that to seven grains of sand now the seven grains of sand is the practice of Sotapanna to an Arahant Lust arises. Lust arises, ill will arises, and so on. Hindrances arise. Mm -hmm. There's a desire for pleasure. Yeah. There's a desire to avoid pain. Yeah, all, all basically, all, like, all, all a noble disciple would have to do is practice sense restraint. He wouldn't need to then be dealing with the doubt as well, whether this is the way out, because he knows. So all he needs to do is not give in to that impulse towards uh, lust or ill will or negligence. All he needs to do is abstain from the uh, impulse and that already results in clarity of what's there, understanding of dukkha, and so on. So Nekama Sankapa developed sufficiently in thoughts of renunciation, Arahanji, for somebody with the right view. And that's where the mm -hmm. work is, mm -hmm. for Noble Disciple. That's what I was talking about enduring and so on. 
allowing things to endure. Yeah. That's already the beginning of it. But yeah, that doubt is always a, a tricky one, isn't it? Because well, yeah, you, you feel like I must address this, but the point realizes well, no. The only reason I want to address this because I want to get rid of the pain of it, not find the right answer. Because yeah. you already know the right answer, and that's when when that doubt is sort of when people like like well, basically irrationally, neurotically. Yeah, but what if? Yeah, but what if? Yeah, but what if? And each time you provide the right answer, and you know it's the right answer, if you were not affected emotionally by that doubt, if somebody were to ask you that same question, you would give the same answer. You know that is the truth. But your weakness is not li it doesn't lie in the fact that you don't have the right answer. It lies in the fact that you can't bear the pain of the doubt. So that's why none of the answers can satisfy it, because you're not really answering for the sake of answer. You're answering it, for the sake of not feeling the pain and that doesn't work you will feel the pain because you act out of pain so your answer is you're acting out of pain because i don't want the pain which means oh i need to endure the pain not revolve around answering the doubt so if you endure the pain sufficiently practice basically thoughts of renunciation of your answering the doubt refraining from it then oh this is the escape of doubt it's the escape of dukkha it's the escape of pain not it's finding the right answer mm -hmm. that's rooted in not wanting the pain so why do you don't want the pain not because i don't know the way out of it or because i do know the way out of it but i'm just impatient and i want it to be go away i don't want to deal with it oh so you're not practicing mm -hmm. rightly then i want the pleasure of not having doubts or well i want the pleasure of not having pain the only reason doubt is a problem is because you don't want to deal with the pain of it that's it and that's by the way even in mundane terms not just in terms of dhamma and you know, <coughs> right view and sort of when people when people's minds revolve around doubt they revolve around it because of the pain of it not because of the not enough information or clarity in regard to the answer in the doubt that's why doubt is a hindrance mm -hmm. because of that emotional well, see you act for it because as if it presents itself as if it needs an answer for clarity, but in reality, it's masked. The problem is the pain, and each time you try to give an answer, all you do is act out of not wanting pain. And that's why pain will be there, because you're feeding it. So, endure the doubt. What if my chicks don't pierce? What if they do this? What if I do that? So you stand up. So the chick, the hen, gets up, sits, goes, moves the eggs. That's why. The chicks will not pierce safely from the shell, through, from the eggs. Because out of her doubt, she keeps moving around and not sitting on the eggs. But it doesn't matter if she doubts. Will my chicks pierce? Will they not? What will happen to them if she doesn't move on account of doubt and endures it and keeps sitting on the chicks? They will pierce out. And when she sees that once, twice, three times, doubt will become meaningless. And you won't be on doubt. Because... Uh, what if, what if, well, there is no what if. I've done this sufficiently enough that I know what I need to do for chicks to pierce out safely. Mm -hmm. But if she keeps fidgeting around and moving, she's actually not doing the work on a kind of trying to fix the doubt and deal with it and make sure that her chicks pierce out safely, ironically enough. So I must find the answer in order to practice rightly. And that's why I'm not practicing rightly, because I keep acting out of pain of doubt. So that's why acting out of doubt is always unwholesome. And even in, in, in our Vinaya rules, acting out of doubt is a wrongdoing. Even if what you did turned out not to be against the rules, the fact that you acted out of doubt was a minor breach of the rules. <laughs> so if you doubt, you don't do it. Even if it might be, oh, maybe, maybe it will be the right answer. Yeah, but it's rooted in the doubt, which means my priority is not the right answer. It's not the clarity of understanding. My priority is getting rid of the discomfort of the doubt. And that's wrong. Right. 